We have been talking about deceptive days the last few times together, and um, if you were here last week, uh, I really uh, appreciate all your letters or you know emails and things that you sent me. Um, it it's really blesses me to hear how the Lord is working through your life and His Word, which He uses to change us. And then also, not only through you, generally, but then through the people that you tell. It's just unbelievable to watch it. So. It's a great thing, and um, I really thank you for that. We talked last time together about really what we sang, and that was the most important thing is reading and studying God's Word for yourself. It's great to be here. It's great to share the Word with each one of you. It's great to talk to you and to read the Word, but it's most important that you do this on your own and to study on your own and to, as Larry was saying, you know, ask the questions of yourself. Not only that... It's most important to apply it, because that's where real change comes from. And then you have the presence of the Spirit that transforms you through it, and then we get some real dynamic things that happen in our lives. We get to go through trials a little bit more. Ah! <laughs> that's what happens. God allows you to go through things a little bit more, because you're a little bit more now equipped to handle the world and its problems. It's really good. But then also, you know, we have to talk about growing up. And growth hurts. Growth is not comfortable. How many, of you, how many of you love to feel pain? Emotional pain. Admit you were wrong. I hate that one. <laughs> but really to do that is the most important thing. It's humility. It's, it's repentance. It's all the things that we talk about. It's all the holidays that we celebrate wrapped up into one Jewish messianic life. A personal life with God, walking together. It's just incredible what a miracle it is. Paul called it a mystery. God in you and me. A mystery. But you know, we also talked about a, a deceptive thing that's going on, and that is about the return of the Messiah. You all, each one of us are hit with this when we tell people about our hope. And the real thing is, well, you know, like, yeah, Messiah is going to return. Who are you talking about? Ah, that's been going on for thousands of years. That cult, like my family always says, oh, you're involved in another thing, a cult. But really, the most incredible thing is there's truth in what the Word says, and that's what I like. But it's not going to be so great. I mean, we can print $3.2 trillion of stimulus money, and the economy's not going to get any better. I just saw a report that said the stock, I heard it from our president. <laughs> who said that the next 10 years are going to be an um, economic flourishing by the stock market in their report. Yeah, right. I say that, respectively. Yeah, right. <laughs> Let me give you another one. There's no pharma that's going to be able to cure the disease and stuff that's coming to this planet. There's no shot that's going to be able to heal you or keep you from what's coming. Yeah. There is no amount of food or shelter that's going to protect us from the judgment that's going to come upon this earth. I'm going to ask you, and I assume I know most of you pretty close. Maybe not you in the camera, but you here. And I assume you know Yeshua. So we speak in general terms here about we know Yeshua as our Savior. But if you don't know him, and you think this is just some weird Jewish thing, or some Gentile thing, or we're just crazy people, I want to scare you into reality that nothing that's going to happen here in the next five years if we're still here on this planet is going to be great. We read in 2 Chronicles, if my people, Jewish people, who are called by my name, Jewish people, will humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways and stop their sinful behavior and the rejection of the, you know, all these things, the United, we take that scripture and apply it to the United States and say this is a beacon of the world. I'm sorry, it's a great country. I'm not trying to be tough. But it's going to be judged. I'm going to give you an escape clause, a key. His name is Yeshua. God that came to this earth, that died for your sins, allowed us an escape clause. We win. 
but it's not going to get better. I'm sorry. Things look impossible right now. The deception that's going on, Dana and I were just talking about things. Who can get the right answer about a simple little shot, right? Who can get a clear presentation of truth going on around the world right now? Each country has its own thoughts, its own desires, its own things. But everything is being pushed into this one world system to get us to be dependent on a one world government and a one world currency and a one, 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 one. <laughs> no amount of racial change is going to stop what's about to hit this planet. Well, there was a guy over 2,500 years ago who had something very interesting to say about what we're talking about today. What do you do in impossible situations? Well, we talked about deceptive times. We should be reading, studying the Word, and applying the Word. But also in an impossible situation in deceptive times, we should be doing one thing. It's communicating with the Creator of this universe. It's called prayer. And we should be diligent in doing that also. You know, Larry, <laughs> I mean... I, I, we talk about this all the time. Larry is constantly reminding us to pray, to pray, to pray. But, you know, just as I said last week, there's an application to it. This week is the same thing. It's an intimacy. It's a closeness with the creator of the universe that you and I both have through Yeshua that other people don't have. They might be able to say something out there, but they can't connect personally. And I say they, meaning Jewish people who haven't received Yeshua yet and Gentile people who haven't received Yeshua yet, they have not connected with the creator of this universe and be able to communicate with him in an open way. We're going to talk about that today in Nehemiah. We're going to discuss what that really means to be able to communicate with the creator of the universe. Not a plan or a prescription on exactly what to say, but the way that our hearts should be when we approach him. So turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 1. Let's read the first chapter of Nehemiah, and this is his first of 11 prayers in the book of Nehemiah. The word of Nehemiah, the son of Hachaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, while I was in Susa. Uh-oh, we know something about that one the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who have escaped and have survived the captivity about Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who served the captivity are in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. When I heard these words, I sat down and I wept. And mourned for days. I was fasting and praying before the, Lord, the God of heaven. And I said, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant which I am praying before you now, day and night, on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel which we have sinned against you. I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments nor the statutes nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote part of the heavens, I will gather them from there and will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. O Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name and to make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. Now, I was the cupbearer to the king. Let's pray. Father, thank you again, our gracious God in heaven, the great and awesome God who provides power on your word to change us. We ask for that power today on your word, the presence of your Ruach HaKodesh upon your words as it goes forth to change our hearts, 
to open our hearts. I pray for everyone that's listening today, Lord, that change would come, hope would come, and we'd be blessed in our Messiah Yeshua's name. Amen. 586 BCE. Set the stage for what we're talking about. 586 BCE, Babylon comes and takes the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom had already been taken in 722. And the northern kingdom had basically intermarried with the Assyrians. And the Assyrians, they came together and they re planted themselves in the land called Samaria, which we have Samaritans. Northern kingdom hated the southern kingdom. Southern, southern kingdom hated the northern kingdom. Now Babylon comes in 586 and takes the southern kingdom into captivity for 70 years. Cyrus, king of Persia, they come in and take over Babylon and set a decree to release our Jewish people back into the land. The first remnant come back into land, some 30,000 Jewish people, and they are attacked by the Assyrian. And they're attacked by the Samaritans. Their own people, which they called half-breeds at that point, we have a huge division between the two kingdoms, southern and northern. Not only that, the people are coming back into the land, into Jerusalem, and the city is destroyed. The walls are broken up and destroyed. The gates are burned. There's no security. And so, after a short period of time, some of those who are in Jerusalem come back to those who are still in, at that time, Persia, Susa, and a man who was a leader, a Jewish man who was a leader with King Artaxerxes, his right-hand man, he's asked to come and help an impossible situation. And that is to rebuild the walls. Now, two other prophets, Haggai and, and, and um, Jeremiah, prophesied to come back and start rebuilding. So that had already happened. But then another period of time had gone on, and Ezra the prophet comes in and calls forth they need to rebuild these walls, and it's not happening. They're having trouble. A man is called, his name is Nehemiah. His name, Nehem, root word, literally means comfort. The people needed comfort. And God called through a prophet, a man named Nehemiah, to come and bring comfort to the people who were suffering in Jerusalem. Do you find yourself in an impossible situation today? It's everywhere. Finances, work, family, friends, other countries, everything around us. Impossible situations. We can't see our way out of it. Nehemiah, same way. He felt that there was nothing he could do, but he was a godly man who applied Scripture in his life and lived a godly life and trusted that the God who created the heavens and the earth could handle this problem. So let's look at Dan and let's look at our outline. Number one, when we have difficult circumstances, it reveals our need for prayer. When we're in a difficult circumstance in our life, we don't try to figure out what we should do and run around and, first of all, you know, think, ah, oh, maybe that'll work or this will work or that'll work. The first thing that we should do is go to the person who is allowing the difficult circumstance to happen in our life, and we should communicate with him. That's called prayer. And one of the things that we saw from Nehemiah, number one, was he had a personal concern for human beings. What we're talking about here is relationship. It's not talking about a country per se. It's not talking about, you know, a need per se. It's talking about human beings and their suffering. Number one, Nehemiah was concerned for people. He said concerning the Jewish people who had escaped and survived the captivity. The amount of suffering that had gone on in the Babylonian captivity was huge. Do you know people who are suffering right now? 
We so easily, when we go to pray for somebody, try to not think about everything that they're going through a lot of times. We just want to say, hey, let me pray for you. God bless you. Have a great time. And we let them go. But do you truly care about the people who you're praying for? What they've gone through? Nehemiah did. In Isaiah 10, 20, it says, Now in that day the remnant of Israel and those of the house of Jacob who had escaped will never again rely on the one who struck them, Babylon, but will truly rely on the Lord, the God of the Holy One of Israel. A remnant will return, the remnant of Yaakov, to the mighty God. For though your people, O Israel, may be like the sand of the sea, only a remnant within them will return. Destruction is determined, overflowing with righteousness. There was a great suffering going on for the people that were taken in captivity in Babylon. Number two, Nehemiah was concerned over the place that they lived. What was it that he was concerned over? Jerusalem, this holy city, the center of all Jewish life. The temple was there. Sacrificial system was now restored, being in place. They had rebuilt the temple. They gathered the people together. Psalm 122 says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem that is built as a city that is compact together. Many of you have been there. You know it's not big. The old city of David, Ir David. To which the tribes go up, even the tribes of the Lord, an ordinance for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Look at verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will now say, may peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your God. Psalm 137 tells of an interesting story. The psalm says, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat and and wept. We sat down and wept. When we remembered Zion... Upon the willows in the middle of it, we hung our harps. For there our captors demanded us of, of, of us songs. And our tormented mirth sang, Sing us one of those songs of Zion. The Babylonians oppressing the people, knowing they're long to come back to Jerusalem. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand literally be cut off. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. So we're not only talking about an interesting personal suffering, but the area in which they were suffering, Nehemiah recognized that it was great. Super heavy. I remember when I first became a believer... One of the first things that I was asked to do was be on a prayer team. And we would pray all night long. We had seven days a week. We had men who were invited in to pray. And there was a list of prayers that we would pray that people would call in and put on this list. And I remember the first time I had gone in, the prayer, my prayer shift was Friday night at 10 o'clock, the party shift. Crazy. So people would call in all night long and want prayer. And you couldn't believe the people. I mean, it was unbelievable what would happen. I, mean, we had, I had a prayer one time from a family from Hogue. They had been driving home at 11 o'clock at night. This just had happened. And they called me and said that they had gotten a head-on car accident and their three-month-old baby in their car seat had gotten thrown out the window. And they said, can you pray for us? Oh, my heart broke. I was like, oh, what do you say to somebody, right? Whose little child is suffering and almost, di- almost de- dead. I mean, what do you do? You go to God. You understand that they're human beings and they need prayer and you connect with God. It was so important as this ministry went on to pray. It was a foundational for whatever I did in life. That first thing, foremost, in anything that I have ever done is to go to God in prayer. That's the encouragement which Nehemiah said, first of all, was that these are people, and he had a concern for the place that they were in. But number two, verse three, we should be sensitive to their present condition. You know, there's people who are suffering that are in really bad condition. 
a lot of times we try to look past those things because we don't feel comfortable about maybe where they've been or what they're talking about or anything like that. But really, if we connect with people and their suffering, we really need to understand their present condition could be really bad. It says in verse 3, the remnant that were there in the providence who survived the captivity were in great distress and reproach. They were being attacked almost daily from all different countries around them and from the Samaritans. Their walls were broken down so that though they would live in the city, they never knew where the attack was going to come from. They lived in fear constantly. And and number one, it says they were suffering. They were in great distress and reproach. The New Italian version of the Bible says, in great trouble and disgrace. They were being shamed. They felt disgrace for their condition. I mean, when we look on the streets around us, most of us who have a lot of wealth, compare, if you talk about the wealth here in the United States compared to what are in other countries like Africa, everyone here is wealthy. <laughs> everyone here has something more than a lot of other people. If you have clothing and shoes, you're rich here in our country. I mean, in other countries, you're seen as, you know, it's unbelievable what they have. They can't understand it. We throw away things that other countries would cherish for a lifetime. But they were living in great distress. James says, or Yahov, is anyone among you suffering? If you are, you must pray. Seek the Lord. Number two, some lack safety. When you're not safe, it brings a different fear into your life, doesn't it? Have, have you ever been in a position of not being safe where your life is threatened all the time? In the land of Israel today, it's that same way. I remember my friend Yehuda Mali, who is the founder of a dig site called Ir David, the city of David in Jerusalem. It's literally what Nehemiah is talking about here. It's the original city of David, Jerusalem. And he told me that when they first walked through the Kidron Valley, if you go through the Kidron Valley and you look up to your western side, you'll see this city sitting up here, which is at that point all broken down. On the one side of the Kidron Valley was an area called the Silwan, which was inhabited by Arab Palestinians who were ran by the PLO at that point in time, 25 years ago. The other side of the city was a dump, which, is, which was the city of David under refuse and he and his best friend walked down the Kidron Valley and were reading Jeremiah and looked up and said that is the original city so by a three year process and a miracle they bought three different properties in the hillside now that was a death sentence to anybody because the PLO was not allowing Jewish people to come in and buy anything in that time and they snuck in and bought these areas on the hillside And in the middle of the night, all three families loaded their children up in their car and all their belongings, drove into the middle of the Kidron Valley, which was very dangerous at the point in time, and moved their families into what we would know today as one of the largest dig sites in Israel called Ir David. They began to become friends with their neighbors. Anybody who was caught, anybody who was caught in the neighborhood of the Silwan Spending time conversing, even being nice to these Jewish families were killed. They would come in in the middle of the night. They would hang them up on a telephone pole. They would start chainsaws, and they would make an interesting (laughs) impression on the people never to accept these Jewish people. Pretty crazy, huh? Today, when you go there, it's a national park. (laughs) I mean, the Ministry of Tourism brings all the kids that are people that are making the Aliyah through this area because it restores their Jewish roots into the city. But the, temp- the walls are broken down. You see, through fear, through suffering, safety, we need to understand that when we pray for people, people are suffering. Isaiah 60, 18 says, You shall call your walls salvation, and, you sh- and your gates praise. What do walls represent but security? Walls don't only keep bad people out. 
but they bring good people together. Not only do they bring good people together, but they give people that are the inside a feeling of security and safety and unity. Walls are good. That's why when we talked last week about guarding your heart, you could put spiritual walls up around you to protect yourself from people who are unsafe in your life. Walls are good. And so, that's what Nehemiah was charged to do, was to help rebuild the city. So, our first thing was, we should definitely, we should definitely do what? We should be praying in difficult circumstances. But number two, we should be dependent on God. And our dependency on God reflects how we approach it in prayer. Do you really trust the Lord? Do, I mean, <laughs> like Larry said earlier, we can read this Bible. We can study the Bible. Without applying it, what does it mean? Well, do we really trust that God's going to be there for us? No matter what situation you're going through in your life. No matter what you're dealing with in life, do you really trust God? Well, let's look at what Nehemiah talked about, about a person who trusts God. Let's look about our attitudes and how we should approach God in prayer. Number one, five things. We need an attitude of humility. Verse 4 says, When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I fasted. Is your heart broken when you come to the Lord? Psalm 51 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. What does that mean, broken and contrite? A heart that's humble. A heart that is broken means somebody who is submissive to God and not trying to take their own plan and implement on God and then say, when it doesn't work out, oh God, I thought you wanted me to do that. You ever heard of that before? You ever done something that you knew you shouldn't have done, but you went and did it, then afterwards you blame God? Because after all, Lord, I like this one, you led me there. Oh yeah, I've heard it, especially in relationships. Whew. The Bible explicitly says that when you are a believer, you're not to marry an unbeliever. That's a hard thing in this world of loneliness. But we, <laughs> people come to us all the time. I, I think he's so wonderful. He's so great. This is what I love. He's got a good job. His family is so nice. You know what we say? Does he know the Lord? Okay, I'll give you one, girls. The guys. She's so wonderful. She completes me. She's my soulmate. Does she know the Lord? No. Run. Oh, but you don't understand. We've been together for two and a half years. He sits in a cubicle next to me at work. We're so close. We go out to dinner all the time. Nope. Why? <laughs> you have nothing in common at this point to build your foundational, spiritual foundation on. It's so dangerous. We, <laughs> we try to reach way outside of the humility that we should have with this attitude and try to reach way past that. Our example is Yeshua, Psalm tw or Philippians 21 he said this, verse 5, Have this attitude in you, which was also in the Messiah Yeshua, who, although he existed in the direct representation of God himself on this planet, did not regard himself equally with God as a thing to be grasped, like, I'm so good because I'm God and I'm going to come down and I'm going to teach you what to do. No, Messiah came here and he emptied himself. Literally, he put himself, his godly attributes and the decision-making process that he had aside and went, I'm going to love these people no matter what they do, no matter how they feel. 
No matter what they say about me, those disciples walking with me when their feet are hurting because they haven't eaten and all this other stuff going on, I'm going to put that all aside. And he made himself in the likeness, a bondservant. Being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself to the obedient death on the Roman execution stake. Can you die to yourself that much? Can you die to your hopes, dreams, and desires of doing what's wrong to do what's right? It's not easy. It's tough. Yaakov 4 says, Submit them yourselves before God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you when you do that. Draw near, and he will draw near to you. You want closeness with God? Humble yourself. Let it go. Don't worry about what's going to happen. Don't worry about what people are going to say. It doesn't matter. What's more important is your connection to God. Number two, we need an awareness of God's nature. When we're coming to God in prayer, when we're coming to talk to Him, communicate to Him, where it's based on God's character. Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God. We're coming to the creator of heaven and earth who has all power to talk to Him and ask Him a need that we have I hear all those, oh, gracious God in heaven. Or you know what one I really like is when somebody has a problem and they come up to you and they say, will you pray for me? And you go, great. And we pray a specific prayer and we think everything's great. And it's like, gosh, that's so great. Thank you so much. And they go right next to you and pray with somebody else about the same exact thing. I mean, do you really recognize that the God you're asking right now for that thing to happen is the God who created the heavens and the earth? And he preserves his own covenant. Number two, that's an issue of faithfulness. Do you know what it says? And hope of eternal life, which God, Titus, cannot lie, promised before the world began. Do you believe that God cannot lie? It's not in his nature. It's impossible for him to lie. So what he promises you might not come to pass in the time that you want it to come to pass, but he promises you the things that he promises because he can't turn back on what he promises you. That's pretty good. He loves you. He cares for you. He knows you're suffering. He knows you're going through things that are impossible, that no man can fix. He can fix them. He can provide for them. He can take care of them. It's based on his covenant, his faithfulness. And number three, it's based on his compassion. Verse five says, loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Your Hebrew word chesed. Unconditional loving kindness. Your English Bibles might say, what's that grace? Something giving to you that you don't deserve. The root word for chesed Chen is grace. So his loving kindness is caught up in giving you something that you don't deserve. You can't be good enough. You can't turn over a new leaf and try to gain his favor. When you come to know Yeshua as your Messiah, you're in. You're an inheritance of everything because of his loving kindness. It's part of who he is. You can approach him because of that. Hebrews 4, 6 says, Therefore let us draw near with confidence. Another version of the Bible says boldly. Not skeot. Don't be skeot. You come to God with confidence. Why? Because of what Yeshua has done for you. It says you come in confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace when we need it. Do you need mercy right now? Have you done something bad? Husbands, I know you have. If you drove here today and there was traffic, you've done something bad. Yeah, I know. I did. <laughs> we need mercy. God holding back the punishment on us that we deserve. <laughs> Psalm 63 says, Because of your chesed, 
It's better than life. My lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness. Why? Because of the unconditional favor and love God gives you. Do you guys like bone marrow? One of the big things right now when you go to all the high-end restaurants is they cut these bones in half and they bake them in the oven and it's all fat and bone marrow. I don't like it. I don't like it because they grow it with cows that have been fed corn and, and it gets all this stuff. But you know what's the most incredible thing in the world? Is when you get a piece of fat that is natural and it's glistening and you like a good ribeye. Lisa, a ribeye, and you bite into that fat, and it just drips, and it's so wonderful. I won't tell you what we have with it, but it's so great. I know, the vegans are like, you are sick. But this is the representation of it. When you don't have any food, and you sacrifice that animal, and some of the part of that animal is the most incredible fat, and you're starving, when you're starving spiritually and you understand <laughs> the loving kindness, the unconditional favor that God gives you, oh, does it taste good. Oh, man, there's nothing like it. The psalmist says, my soul is full because of that fat. Number three, we need an acknowledgement of sin, verse 6 and 7. <laughs> there's an interesting thing that can separate our, our prayers from God. You know, God doesn't have to hear everything you say. Psalm 66 says, if I regard iniquity, sin in my heart, the Lord doesn't hear me. That's a direct attack on our pride, isn't it? Oh, Lord, I can't believe this is happening to me. I only stole $10,000 from my best friend, but this is the worst thing that could ever, you know. <sighs> Isaiah 59 says, But your iniquities have been a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so he will not hear me. Isaiah, husbands, or excuse me, Peter, husbands, in the same way that they are to submit to you, you submit to them. That's context. <laughs> Live with your wives in an understanding way. They have a portion of their life that's emotional that you need to be sensitive to. That's what that weaker side means. Show honor as an heir of grace. Because if you don't, I'm not going to listen to your cries to me about how miserable your life is because how hard she is on you. How you throw your underwear under the bed thinking that's the clothes hamper. Or whatever we do as men, right? You want your prayers hindered? Just don't get along with your wife. Submit to her, her needs, her desires, her wants. Be gracious to her. Just like she's doing to you. It's called the unity. Well, that's a different marriage seminar. When there's a need of closeness in prayer, he said, let your ear now be attentive in your eyes. What does that mean to be attentive? When my kids were young, when they were babies... I used to walk into their room at night at 3 in the morning and I would go next to their face and I would put my ear right over their breath and I would feel their breath. You know when they're babies, how wonderful it is? And, you, and they breathe on you. That's what it means when he's, bring your ear attentive. Do we want the closeness of God? Do we want him to hear? Yes. Number two, there's a need for confession. <sighs> what does confession mean? Larry said, a couple of weeks ago, I heard everybody was like, because oh, I'm up there in the booth, I can hear everything in the audience. He says, you don't need to sit there and keep saying, God, forgive me for my sin. You have already been forgiven. But what do you need to do? Confession means, when it says in 1 John, if I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive, it means you, ek, out of your mouth, logically agree with him that you're nasty and you did it. Lord, I've blown it. Thank you for forgiving me. You, you stop walking around defeated all the time. I'm such a nasty person. Don't you think God knew before the foundation of the world that you were nasty? <laughs> you need to confess. 
agree. David said after his blunders with Bathsheba, who he covered up by himself, he said, oh my gosh, be gracious to me, Lord. According to your chesed, I need that. According to the greatness of your compassion, I've murdered my one and strongest leader in the military field. I've lied, I've cheated, I've deceived. Wash me thoroughly. Cleanse me from my sin. I know my transgression. My sin is always in front of my brain. I cannot run from this anymore. And this is the most important thing that I see in Psalm 51. He says, against you and you only have I sinned in your sight. Not the woman that you gave me made me do it. Or that beautiful girl that was on the housetop down there bathing on the top, you know. That just, that lust, you know. Lord, oh my gosh. He said, I did it. I willfully broke your commandments. I sinned against you. And I need your chesed. I need your mercy. I need your kindness. When we come to God, when we pray, we need to be that open. Number three, we need a clarity of our actions. He said, we have acted corruptly against you. We caused damage, literally in the Hebrew, to God's heart. That's what it means. When we sin, we, we hurt God's heart because we didn't do what he said to do. What's the fourth thing? We need to appeal to God's promises. When we pray, when we approach God, because we have the ability to do that, we can be confident by coming to God and appeal to his promises. And we need to recognize the consequences for our unfaithfulness. Remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are faithful, unfaithful, excuse me, I will scatter you among the people. Let me just say this. We're almost done, but let me say this to you. If you willfully don't want to do what God wants you to do, if you want to sin against God, there's a penalty here on this earth. And there's a penalty in heaven. Maybe go, oh, I just don't won't get so many rewards. How do you know what that really means? <laughs> we don't. We know there's rewards, but what do we know? We lose some rewards. Oh, I can just do this and, you know, no. We remember that there is a penalty. Number two, we remember what God did if there is repentance. If you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, those of you who do this, and you have been scattered in the most parts of heaven, I will gather you back together. Well, we're waiting as we watch the nation of Israel right now coming back. But there's not a huge turn to Yeshua. There's some people turning, but they, people haven't nationally committed their lives to the Mashiach yet. But they're being gathered together as a moth from a flame, and there's some bad things that are going to happen. I don't like to think about that kind of stuff, but it's not a good thing. But when people are coming back to the land, there's an earmark that something big is going to happen. Remember that. But lastly, we need to ask for help. It's okay. It's okay to ask for help. If you're humble, you realize you need help. One, it's emphasized by our role as a servant. He said, O oh Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant. We talked about what a doulos was, a bond servant last week. Someone who has been freed from all their debt and comes back to the person they were enslaved to and puts their ear under that lentil and doorpost of the house under the mezuzah and has their ear punched with an owl, puts an earring in, there's blood on the doorpost. They are for eternity given to the one whom they gave their slavery to. You're a bond servant, willfully, supposedly. That's not a new covenant thing. It says in Exodus 7, which is the most important thing we see when God leads his people from Egypt. This whole idea that they might serve God after being released from the bondage of Egypt. He said, you shall say to Pharaoh, to the, the Lord God of heaven or the Hebrews sent me to you, saying, let my people go, that you may serve me in the wilderness. But behold, you haven't listened. Exodus chapter 8, Exodus chapter 9, Exodus chapter 10. Reiteration. Shalachami vi'havaduni, meaning... Let them go. 
that they may serve me. Ooh. Aved, be a servant, a willful servant to follow after God's charge in his word, to do what he says to do. You have been set free from the bondage of sin so that you can serve him, whatever capacity that might be. Let's try reading and studying the word. Let's try being obedient to the word. Let's try expressing that to people around us. Let's start growing up and being more kind to one another. All those wonderful things that we're supposed to do as servants. So another one is emphasized by his role as a servant. Number two is express for God's need for blessing. Are you dependent on God's blessing you? Make your servant successful. Everybody goes, oh, we need money. So does everybody. And when you have it, you need more. It never ends. What is success but being spiritually successful? We need that. And number two, and it's explained by a simple statement. The simple statement he says, Nehemiah, is now I was the cupbearer to the king. Why would he say that in a prayer? Well, if you remember the wonderful story of Esther, how she was scared to death. She said, if I have to go to him and approach him, that was a death sentence. Mordecai said, if you perish, if I, she says that to Mordecai, if I perish, I perish. This was a death sentence for him to go and approach the king, our desertion, and say, can I go back and rebuild the wall? So what do we see? Fear. Is fear keeping us from doing what God wants us to do? Is fear keeping us from just walking in the word because we don't know what's going to happen if we change? Is fear keeping you from approaching God and asking him for things that you need? Shul, Rabbi Shul says, it's the most incredible thing to those in Philippi. He says, be anxious or stop worrying literally, he said in chapter 4, verse 6. Stop worrying because we do about anything everything but in all things through figuring it out on our own and going out and doing it what does he say say it through all things in what prayer first thing and supplication so it's supplication it's like meatballs on spaghetti it's the perfect additive <laughs> and the final thing is thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God. And he says, and the peace of God, shalom, bringing everything together in unity, which surpasses all understanding, will be a wall around your heart and mind, which is in Yeshua, the Messiah. Simplicity. The simple statement. Abraham Lincoln said, I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My own wisdom and that of those about me seemed insufficient for the day. Think about today where we live in our country. That's a pretty heavy statement what he went through. Main idea. We can come to God at any time as believers, day and night, depending on his nature and his character to see each one of us through difficult, impossible situations. Impossible. You today are sitting here, most of us as believers, go to God. If this is confusing to you, you haven't received Messiah, there's difficult times Worse than this are coming. It's time to receive him. Confess your sin. And walk in the newness of life. Join us as we struggle every day together. Right? Let's pray. Abba, thank you for your word. Thank you for your kindness, your chesed. Oh, we don't deserve it. For your mercy that's new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We get up every single day and we can trust that you are faithful for what you say and you promise us. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for 
my friends, my family here today, that as we come together in the power of your spirit, the message of Yeshua can go forth through the world. For those who don't know him, today as the spirit convicts any person's heart right now that's listening to this, I pray you'd respond and say, Yeshua died for my sins according to the Tanakh and that he was buried and that he resurrected so that I could have life. I receive him now in Yeshua's name. We pray these things today. We pray that you'd be all filled with the Spirit. In our Messiah's name we pray. Amen.